All right, we're changing uh, subject today. Uh, we're going to talk uh, more on variational methods, but uh, some new methods. Uh, before I start the lectures from the last uh, uh, from last Thursday and Tuesday, they're updated they're on the web. Uh, it took me lots of times to fix about the 1,000 formulas, so I hope someone reads them. Okay, they have a lot of valuable information. Some things we do not cover, so please take a look. All right. So maybe they, because today I'm going to be uh, jumping on this particular lecture notes. Uh, I am not going to emphasize the big extent of what exactly the local variation methods are, but I will uh, give you some sort of uh, uh, new ideas. Okay. So let me review, so we can uh, uh, deviate a little bit from what we know. So we. Uh, the key ingredient in variational methods was we have some data, we have uh, some affiliated latent uh, variables with each uh, data point, and we wrote the, this is the fun fundamental identity, uh, the log likelihood being the lower bound plus the distance between Q and P. And uh, what is important to remember is both the definition of the lower bound plus the fact that here you have the KL distance between Q and P, because this distance is not symmetric, okay? So Q is the variational approximation of uh, the posterior of the latent variables, okay? P is this distribution, and the lower bound basically is the expectation with respect to the variational distribution of this log here that involves the joint log likelihood and the variational distribution. And we have seen that uh, this is uh, an easy way to, to work with because the joint log likelihood is usually uh, a very, you know, it's a Gaussian or an exponential time of family of distributions, but if you marginalize Z out, the distribution you get can be a Gaussian mixture, for example, something that is not computationally easy to work with. Okay, so uh, this is the lower bound. Uh, this is the KL distance. Uh, I'm going to come back to this equation shortly, but, uh, you know, in some ways you can uh, also consider the joint log likelihood as being the anormalized version of the posterior. Okay? So if you see it like this, then you can immediately see, and I have this on another slide, but you can write this as minus uh, the KL distance between Q and the anormalized posterior. Usually you don't see that in the literature, but I think I'm going to make use of that in the lectures today. All right. Uh, okay. So uh, this methodology basically we apply to a lot of problems. Okay. And uh, it comes with uh, different names, but basically variational Bayes is what you see in the literature. So today we're going to try to introduce some new methods where instead of minimizing the distance between Q and P, or maximizing this, uh, we will try to minimize the opposite KL distance, the distance between P and Q. You say, why not? Right? I mean, if this is an, an acceptable uh, distance, okay, uh, you may argue about that, why not uh, minimize the opposite distance between P and Q? So I'm writing this explicitly here as minus the actual uh, posterior, and this is the variation on distribution. Obviously, you can see that um, this is not an easy integral to calculate because uh, you have to basically to take the expectations of this with respect to the exact posterior. Well, uh, have I done some mistake here? Z of x, right? Thank you. So this is the, uh, so basically here we'll correct this, right? So uh, effectively, you have to take uh, an expectation with, with respect to the exact posterior, which you don't know. That's what we need to approximate. However, we're going to do some algebra with this, and we will see that it leads to a whole category of algorithms that they are extremely popular in the uh, in for large scale problems, especially in graphs that go with the name expectation propagation and, and very various variants of that. Okay, so we will see that today. I think uh, I have uh, shown you this trivial example uh, so that you can keep your eyes on. 
So this is sort of a, a, a distribution that uh, it's a man-made distribution, some Gaussian term, some sigmoid thing, and we try to approximate this uh, with different things that we have seen up to now in the class. So let's say this is the actual distribution, uh, this dark region. Uh, this is the Laplace approximation that uh, uh, we already have discussed it, uh, centered around the mode. And uh, this is, uh, I suppose, this is the uh, distribution that you get with variational Bayes by minimizing the distance between uh, Q and P. And I'm going to show you later on in the lecture, on the top of this graph, the same plot, but minimizing the distance between P and Q, and you will see that things look a little bit different. Or a lot of different. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, let me go back to this uh, uh, to the fundamental problem in variational methods. We wanted to minimize the distance of uh, uh, Q uh, uh, from P, uh, or to maximize, right? Uh, to maximize the uh, the lower bound. And I just mentioned before that the lower bound is really nothing else but the KL distance between uh, Q and the anormalized posterior. You agree? Does this look to you like uh, the lower bound without a minus sign? Is that the lower bound without the minus sign? So if I plug in a minus sign there, right, you can see that really this is the distance between Q and curly P, where curly P is basically an anormalized posterior. So this is just another way to look at it, but I'm going to make uh, use of uh, this here. Uh, if you expand, actually, this problem, you basically get uh, that this is equal to the distance between Q and P uh, plus some, uh, some constant term, okay, normalization term. So uh, remember that this... Um, the lower bound, you can actually itself, you can write it as, uh, uh, as uh, you know, as a KL distance. All right. So let me go and introduce, uh, I'm going to jump a lot of slides. Uh, since you don't have a copy of the slides, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to go a long way down the road. All right. So uh, we will discuss approximating posteriors, but uh, in uh, problems that are sort of graph theoretic. So I'm going to give you uh, a, a simple setup where uh, we try, let's, let's say, uh, we have uh, uh, data coming from a Gaussian, and we want to compute the unknown mean of the Gaussian, and we put some prior on that mean, so basically the posterior is written as uh, the prior times the likelihood with IID looking like that. So basically, the graph theoretic uh, version of this problem is uh, using a factor graph. You have uh, a factor node that uh, encodes uh, the probability of the prior. And then for each likelihood term, you have another factor that connects uh, this is a mu with uh, the data xi that you get. OK, so we have something like that. So what I want you to pay attention, uh, and this will be fundamental to our problems today, when you try to estimate here, uh, we try to approximate this, notice that the exact posterior factorizes. All right? So basically, here obviously it factorizes because we collect data one at a time. So P of X1 given M, P of X2 given M. But you can think almost in every uh, probabilistic graphical model thing, there is a factorization. So in, um, in directed graphs, maybe we factorize on the probability of the nodes given their parents. In, uh, uh, you know, in undirected graphs, we factorize as products of uh, potentials over clicks. So there is a factorization. And the idea is now, can we actually figure out a way to come up with some approximation of these posteriors uh, in a way that somehow mimics this factorization? Right? Obviously. If the exact distribution looks like that, maybe uh, it only makes sense to have some induced factorization for the variational distribution. So this is what we're going to try uh, to take advantage of today. OK, so let me um, uh, introduce you an example, which uh, we will uh, play with uh, later. 
This again, estimating uh, the mean of the distribution. So we sample from a Gaussian. This is the Gaussian. But actually, we, uh, the actual distribution we, so we want to compute this mean theta like in the previous problem. But actually, the distribution we sample is not this clean Gaussian, but this Gaussian plus some noise. All right? So this is what's called the clattering problem. So if you can think of you having this Gaussian, you really want to estimate this mean. But the samples you get are basically either going to come from the actual Gaussian, or they're going to be just noise, irrelevant to the estimation of the parameter theta. So in this problem, we're interested to compute theta. So if you write basically the unnormalized posterior as the prior times the likelihood. And uh, each of the likelihood terms is a Gaussian mixture. So if you have n data points and you expand this product there, you're going to get 2 to the n terms. So the posterior is going to be very complicated. OK? So can we actually do this um, with uh, variational methods uh, in a way that is, uh, uh, is computationally easy to work with? Okay. So we will discuss this problem today. We'll spend a few slides. OK. Uh, this slide has lots of uh, substance. And I think it's most probably the only theoretical slide in the note today. So uh, try to pay attention. We're going to assume for everything we're going to do today that whatever variational approximations we use and can be the whole distribution or uh, maybe some uh, factor in the approximation, we're going to assume that those factors are coming from the exponential family. So in this particular case, I write the distribution Q of z given uh, some uh, natural parameter theta in the generic form of the exponential family distributions. G of z are the sufficient statistics, and the rest are basically uh, uh, you know, uh, some normalization term and h of z term this is the form we use for the exponential family. Okay? And that includes a lot of different distributions. All right, so let's go to this uh, new problem, which is the minimization of the distance of the actual distribution P and the variation distribution Q, where here we assume that Q is exponential family distribution. So, um, all right, uh, you remember the KL distance is minus p log of what? Of q over p. All right? So where is this coming? So I have to calculate this. You have to take minus the expectations with respect to p of the log of q over p. All right? And that p in the denominator, basically, with this p, will give me a constant because it uh, doesn't depend on Q. So we're going to get minus the expectation of the log of this. So, uh, and we're looking at only terms that depend uh, you know, here on uh, Z and eta. So we're going to have minus log of Z. And the exponential will give me uh, eta transpose. And the expectation with respect to P of Z, that's the exact distribution of U of Z. You agree that this is basically the KL distance of that? using that Q, right? Again, in the KL distance, there's a minus sign. So minus P of log of um, Q over P. So you're going to get minus uh, the expectation with respect to, to P of the log of Q, right? So we take log of Q expectation with a minus sign. You get that. OK. So we want to find uh, the parameter theta that minimize this reverse KL divergence. So you're going to take the derivatives with respect to eta, and you're going to set them equal to 0. So you're going to have the gradient of this term with respect to eta. Uh, so this is gradient again with respect to eta. And this will give you the expectation of u of z with respect to p of z. And obviously, I forgot to put here uh, the expectation of u of z. Okay? So actually, the equa this equation here should look like, uh, no, actually, this is something different. So here, we have to put brackets of u of z, OK? So we, uh, the calculation of eta is uh, such that the optimal eta is such that the gradient minus the gradient of the log of z is the expectation of u 
with respect to the exact P of Z, and the exact P of Z, of course, is not known. Now, uh, and I'm not going to prove it. Uh, you can look at the notes from uh, uh, last semester. You can go to uh, Wikipedia for exponential family distributions. If you, uh, if Q is an exponential family distribution, you can show for any Q in this family that minus the gradient of the log of G is the expectation of the sufficient statistics with respect to Q of G. Anybody knows that? Uh, the calculation is literally one line. Okay, so for any distribution, there's no approximation here. If I have a uh, distribution from the exponential family, and you take the expectation of the sufficient statistics with respect to Q, all right, this comes to me minus the gradient of the log of G. And you can extend this actually to higher derivatives as well, you know, uh, for calculating other moments. All right. So this is an identity for uh, any distribution from the exponential family. And this is uh, an identity that we computed by minimizing the reverse KL divergence. OK? This is our problem. We want to find the eta star all right, so that we minimize the reverse KL divergence. So you can see this is minus gradient of log of G minus gradient of log of uh, G. So you can put this expectation with respect to P of Z of the U of Z the term that was here, all right, equal to the expectation of u of z with respect to q of z, and then you get this nice identity here, which is our final result. And that result says that the expectation of u of z with respect to the approximate distribution is the same as the expectation of u of z with respect to the exact distribution. Uh, and obviously, you can push it further and you use um, a second order moment you can show that the variance of u of z with respect to q of z equal to the variance of u of z with respect to p of z, etc., etc. So the conclusion is that when you try to minimize the KL distance from a distribution p from another distribution q in the exponential family, all right, then the moments of p and q match. Okay, so the distributions p and q have the same moments. Now you may say. So does that mean that uh, uh, because the moments of an exponential distribution really define the distribution, that P is uh, uh, an exponential distribution? No. The idea here is we're going to approximate P, whatever P is, with a family from the exponential distribution. But we know that family is going to be such that the moments of the sufficient statistics, we have to match the moments that we get uh, with respect to the exact distribution P of C. And that's why you will see this in the literature sometimes. People call this moment matching. Okay, Very much different from what uh, we have seen in, uh, uh, up to now. So for example, if um, uh, you make Q of Z, because this exponential family to be a Gaussian, right? and you try to approximate with, uh, a Gaussian, uh, with a Gaussian any distribution P of Z, then don't get surprised that mu has to be the mean of P of Z and that sigma has to be the variance of P of Z. And I remind you somewhere actually in the earlier uh, uh, notes, maybe two or three lectures ago, we tried to approximate the distribution P with the Gaussian. And I want you to go back and see when we minimize the distance of Q from P, not P from Q, did we actually get this result or we got something else? Here, if we minimize the distance of P and Q, me, uh, the mu will have to be the mean of P of Z, uh, you know, uh, of P of Z and the sigma will have to be the variance of P of Z. Okay. So, um, uh, so here is, for example, if uh, you try to compute some parameters, you know, let's say the mean of the Gaussian, all right, and uh, this is the dark blue is the exact distribution. So when you minimize with moment matching, you will get uh, a Gaussian that basically looks like that. Okay. So you get this with moment much. All right, let's make things now more difficult. Not by design, but uh, just, uh, you know, uh, we like difficult things so you don't guys fall to sleep. So we are going to uh, apply this idea of moment matching, basically, and come up with a new method, a very powerful method for doing inference in graph that is called expectation propagation. 
and you can maybe start envisioning what, what the word expectation propagation means. The same way we did message passing in graphs, right? The idea here that you see the word expectation, maybe what we pass in the graph are moments, all right? Because the local op uh, operations somehow we are going to be doing would be minimizations of p from some variational uh, exponential family distribution key, q. So uh, we would be passing moments, and that's why the method is called expectation propagation. So we assume, um, you know, this is uh, uh, the data we collect. This is some unknown parameter. And I'm going to do a different versions of this type of problems. Uh, it's introducing sort of different algorithms. But right now, uh, in your typical inference problem, you collect data. They depend on some parameters theta. Uh, so this is. Um, uh, uh, you know, we can factorize basically the joint distribution like that. Maybe the first term or the zero term, you can make the prior and all the other terms the likelihood terms. Okay? So the idea here is uh, we're going to assume basically uh, that uh, these likelihood terms, for example, okay, uh, they are not sort of easy to work distribution. They're not Gaussians, right? That's the whole idea of approximating something with a Gaussian is it's not Gaussian to start with. So the, the exact posterior looks like this, uh, 1 over p of d times these factors. And again, I have incorporated here uh, the prior inside the factors uh, themselves. So remember that we're going to be using that the first term in the factorization is basically the prior. The rest of the likelihood terms. This is the, uh, the normalization term. OK? So we're going to uh, look at this equation. And uh, we're going to say, well, you know what? If we're going to try to approximate this with some variation distribution, we should take advantage uh, of uh, this factorization and maybe postulate some uh, variation distribution q of theta that is a similar factorization. OK? Now, what is uh, maybe not of significant interest here, right? Because this is an easy problem. You notice that. When I assume this factorization, each of these factors depends on the same unknown theta. So this is your classical Bayesian inference problem. So you can think if you know you have uh, various hyperparameters, mean variances. You know these are the thetas. So every factor f i with a curl depends on theta. Okay, uh, we will see later on. But maybe we should even have another factorization where these factors don't involve the same unknown theta. But right now, that's what we have. OK. So um, so we need to approximate this distribution that is computationally intractable with this approximation. Can you give me your thoughts on um, different possible algorithms you may come up with you know, to approximate this with that? I mean, just tell me everything that is potentially a feasible algorithm. I mean, what would be the most obvious thing someone to say when you try to approximate this without? I mean, so for example, you can think here, right? If you collect data, one data uh, at a time, so data one comes, somebody may say, oh, you know what? I'm going to go and do an approximation of F1. Uh, data 2 comes, so I'm going to go and do an approximation of F2. Will that work? What do you think? Can we approximate basically each factor independently of the other? You think it will work? I mean, the whole idea here is right that. The emphasis is not if we approximate each individual factor well. The objective is to approximate this whole thing well. So if the factors individually maybe are good, who cares? Because the product may be lousy. Okay. So for example, um, let's consider. Uh, I think this is uh, I don't know from where this uh, pictorial comes, but let's consider uh, an exact distribution. So let's say the first factor, F1, is uh, 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 a mixture of two Gaussians. OK, that's F1. 
And uh, let's say we're going to approximate this factor with this, uh, with a Gaussian, because it has to be in the exponential family. So we're going to approximate this with this nice Gaussian. So the second factor, F2, looks like a Gaussian, so we get an excellent approximation. All right, so if you take, so this is the exact product of F1 and F2. This is really what we want to approximate well. And now this is the product of the two approximations. And you see it is not a very good uh, calculation because mainly we screw it up there. Okay? But if somehow uh, you do it right, all right, we don't know how, you are going to tell me, you get this other approximation that looks to be very good. So the idea here is when you approximate F1, right, uh, you put a lot, of, a lot of probability mass in the approximation to match F1, but you really you forgot that the probability mass of F2 here is zero. So you, like you're investing a lot of money to approximate well F1 in a region that doesn't, uh, you don't care. So when you do the approximation itself F1, you have to do uh, in relevance to what F2 does. And when you approximate F2, you have to do it in relevance to what F1 does. Does that remind you anything? In the context of variational methods. Where do we calculate something in the context of what the rest of the variables do? Huh? The what? The main field. You didn't need to have lunch, Nick. You have no odds. All right. Okay. So this will be a mean field like, right? But maybe who knows uh, if it uh, will look like a mean field. But the concept here is we don't approximate these factors independently of each other. But uh, um, so we try to, to do something better than that. Uh, all right. So uh, here's how the idea goes for uh, this algorithm. And again, it is not very complicated, but you need to pay attention. The algebra, um, uh, you know, uh, may, may look a little bit confusing. It is really not. Okay? So let's say we are going to approximate only the factor fj. And I remind you, this scale thing refers to the approximation, the uh, approximate distribution q of theta. So this is factor j. So we remove that factor out because we want to approximate now that factor. We're going to do iterations, right? like in the mean field uh, approximation theory. So this uh, is the product of all the other factors. OK? Now, this is how we're going to pose the problem. Rather than trying to make this little factor fj to be close to this fj, we're going to try to make this distribution as close as possible to the true fj times this background of all the other FIs for these FIs are the approximate FIs. All right? So, again, where is the background for when we compute F1? Where is F2 coming? It's coming here. So, we're going to be approximating, all right, this whole distribution to be as close as possible to that, all right, where this is the exact factor, all right? But this is, we use the approximation of all the other factors that we obtained up to now. OK, we're going to do this iteratively, right? So whatever factors we have for the others, whatever approximations, this is what we use as the background, OK? Uh, the idea here is we want to have an approximation for Fj that is accurate in the regions where the remaining factors have uh, significant probability mass. Right? If they're zero, who cares? We're not going to account for that. Uh, we don't want to, to invest resources on that approximation. OK, uh, some uh, definitions. I'm going to try not to use, you, to use uh, all the buzzwords here. Uh, you notice here we have uh, this product of the background distributions, all but the term J. So what I'm going to do is I am going to define um, this uh, background uh, Q as Q of all the Q factors except factor J. So effectively, this Q of theta divided by this approximation F of J. Okay? Um, this has, in uh, physics, comes with uh, a particular name, all right? Because even this idea comes from physics, but we will leave that thing out. So this is 
all the factors, the product of all the factors but J, okay? All right? Uh, so uh, in that way, we can write actually uh, this uh, distribution here as the actual of J times this distribution Q minus J, okay? And uh, ZJ here is uh, a normalization factor, okay? So uh, ZJ here is defined like that. All right. So what we want is we want to make this, all right, as close as possible to that. So here is the problem. We want to find an update of the distribution Q. And notice, I am not asking an update of the factor FJ of theta. What I'm asking is an update of the whole Q of theta. We're going to update the factor QJ, but I'm posing the problem, not compute, yeah, we're going to update this factor FJ tilde, right? But I'm posing the problem, find me this update of Q of theta so that it matches that, okay? So the problem is find Q of theta, and I call this uh, Q nu of theta, so that the distance between this uh, and this is uh, minimized. And you notice this is a reverse scale distance because the true factor of j comes to the left. Okay? This is very important. All right? So it's uh, what we discussed today. All right? Uh, so this is the true factor. Okay? Uh, all right? So um, uh, do we know what the solution of this problem is? Can you tell me with words? Basically, what is the distribution Q of theta? All right? Uh, that uh, does solve this minimization problem. And of course, we're going to constrain Q of theta. You know, every term in the factorization of Q of theta is in the exponential family. So the product of exponential family distributions is an exponential family distribution. So what's the exact answer to this problem? What is basically coming out of the optimization? Says that, right? Moment matching. So basically, the moments of Q of theta have to match with the moments of that. Okay? So when you look at weight, right? So effectively, let's say if this is Gaussian, it's like, uh, I'm going to use the terminology used in practice, right? Like taking the distribution on the left hand side and projecting it to Gaussian. Say, force it to be Gaussian. But effectively, what we do is we extract the moments out of that, and we assign those moments to an affiliated Gaussian. Okay? And that operation, basically, you will see it written in the literature as a projection operator. So think of this. You know, whatever distribution you have, you want to approximate it with a Gaussian through this moment matching. And so you extract the moments, and then you assign them to a Gaussian. So that's the projection step. So. Uh, here is, uh, so we, uh, we computed the new distribution uh, Q nu of theta, and then we want to update the factor of j. And I remind you, the distribution Q of theta is written as fj times uh, this uh, uh, product of all the other approximation factors. So basically, fj of theta will be some normalization factor that you need times a normalized distribution Q of nu uh, that you compute from this problem divided now by the product of all the other factors that you have. You see that? Because we only need to update, now that's the update of the factor j. So again, the idea here is we approximate the whole Q of theta. Okay? And, uh, and now once that is done with moment matching, if we divide it by the product of the approximations, the factorization Q of four times per j, we're going to get FJ. Okay? And uh, you can, so K is a normalization constant. So uh, we assume that when uh, uh, you compute Q of theta, you normalize it. So with normalized Q, if you uh, integrate this in theta, so you have this product integrated in theta K times Q nu. So Q nu d theta is uh, 1, so you get uh, K. So K is basically uh, this normalization factor, all right? And we call this actually ZJ. So the update formulas 
for the expectation uh, propagation algorithm is what you see on the bottom. All right, so the idea is again, uh, do moment matching, okay, compute a whole new Q, divide by Q minus J, uh, multiply with the normalization factor, that's the update of factor J. That's it. Okay, uh, so I am going to emphasize again the key, two key points, right? Uh, we compute each factor, all right, uh, not independent of the other uh, factors, but uh, uh, in a way that the, the probability of the other factors is accounted in the approximation, and we do this by not matching FJ, uh, this FJ curly with the exact FJ, but by matching Q of theta with this, okay? And uh, so we don't update the factor FJ to start with, we update the whole distribution Q of theta, and from that, we can update the factor of j once we're done. And, uh, and the approximation, again, is uh, given on the bottom. So um, all right, so this is, um, so think of this uh, as, you know, uh, let's say that this is the exact factor of j, all right? And um, uh, this is uh, what uh, the, uh, you know, all the other factors are doing. So can you imagine if you go and you try to match this, so this is sort of a, an extreme, right, uh, uh, pictorial here. If you try to optimize um, FJ curly to match this blue distribution, you're gonna get something that looks like that Gaussian. But then what happens? The background distribution, it is far away from the FJ, okay? So now, what that does is it pulls the approximation of the factor of j to be closer somewhere in between, all right? And the approximation for the whole distribution basically uh, serves, it is, uh, you know, serves the, the probability, uh, you know, the non-zero probability domain of this uh, Q minus j distribution. Uh, so by the way, you can see here the notation that I told you uh, it is very common uh, both algorithmically and, you know, in describing what is going on. So when you, you know, you remember uh, we uh, we are matching, we compute a new Q new. Uh, so that operation of uh, matching moments with the distribution that you see here inside the brackets is called the projection operator. Okay. So think of it again. You know, uh, you are extracting the moments and you try to match this uh, to the corresponding Gaussian distribution. Let's say. Okay, um, and so I will show you an example actually where uh, this distribution here can be, uh, let's say, Poisson distribution, then you have to approximate it with this projection operator to a Gaussian. Now, um, let me discuss um, uh, a complexity that maybe you haven't thought about this before. Okay, and when you work with this algorithm, this can be a blessing, but also it can be sort of a very painful process. So let's say that uh, this uh, exponential farm distributions are all Gaussians, right? That's the, the more standard example of exponential distribution. Uh, um, okay, so this Gaussian. Obviously, this projection will give you the Q nu that is also going to be Gaussian. What happens when you divide two Gaussians? I haven't discussed anywhere in class before, right? We know product, we know marginalization, this conditional. Now we have a ratio of two Gaussians. Do you see any problem? Are you happy dividing two Gaussians? What can happen? Such as, or what type of numerical issues? Um, because these are exponentials, actually, I don't think the division by zero will be a problem here, okay? Because they're exponentials. Uh, but if you have Gaussians, what type of distribution are you going to get? Is the ratio going to be a Gaussian? Because this factor is supposed to be in the exponential family, too, right? 
Everything is the exponential function. So if I divide two Gaussians, do I get a Gaussian? Yeah, but do I get a Gaussian that maybe has negative audience? Of course, yes. There's absolutely zero guarantee that this thing uh, will not be a Gaussian that is turned upside down. So actually, this is not that it may happen. It happens all the time. So actually, uh, we're going to have to be losers to what the Gaussian means here. We're going to allow these terms to be sort of uh, uh, exponential squares, you know, or square exponential functions, you know, with negative audience. The only thing we are interested to enforce is, right, that at the end of the day, that this is a Gaussian. But some of the factors may come to have actually a negative audience. Okay? And, and uh, uh, you will see this in, uh, with examples, but, you know, uh, uh, you may want to actually check these formulas. I didn't have time this morning to uh, verify them uh, again. Uh, so if you uh, take the ratio of the two Gaussians, okay, you can, uh, you basically get a, Gauss, um, a Gaussian, right? But you notice the variance is 1 over V1 minus 1 over V2. The the, these are the variances of numerator and uh, denominator. And obviously, this can be negative. Obviously, it can be negative. Okay? So, again, it is not an issue, uh, but um, how you program this is something you need to be sort of uh, uh, very careful. All right? So, these are not your uh, everyday Gaussians. All right? So, let me um, uh, show you another schematic on this uh, approximation of expectation propagation. Uh, uh, on the clutter problem that I introduced, and I'm going to discuss this problem extensively. And uh, the two pictures basically, uh, they show the two approximations that you get when uh, the context or the support of the Q minus J distribution uh, that you use as the background distribution where you do the computation in the top two uh, pictures is narrow, right? So you can see uh, the this. This uh, distribution here is the context. This is the Q minus J, okay? And uh, you can, what is important here to see is that the actual approximation of the factor FJ that you do eventually with uh, expectation propagation, it is only good uh, uh, in the region where the support of Q minus J uh, is non zero, okay? So you can see everywhere else, right? Uh, the approximation is very lousy. This is FJ, this is, you know, okay? So here the approximation is good. Uh, and uh, the same, you know, uh, the support here is non zero there. You can see how good the approximation looks. Uh, the blue and what is it, the, uh, the, the red, they basically uh, coincide. Here now you have a background, a context that is uh, much wider. So you notice the approximation is, is not anymore as good, right? Because this is very wide. Uh, this is to be expected. All right, and similarly here, yeah, the approximation starts deviating. Basically, it's not very good all over the support. So if you have a narrow support, right, it's the same way you do inference, right? If your prior is all over the space and you have no data, uh, that's the uh, issue that uh, you get in uh, posterior estimation. All right, uh, look for the last time on the algorithm because we're going to be moving away from this. Okay, so the algorithm looks. You initialize all the factors, right? You have to start with something. Usually, you can just put them all to be Gaussians with some mean and variances. Um, uh, so this is your approximation for the whole uh, uh, posterior distribution. Then you start updating one factor at a time. You remove that factor to form this uh, cavity distribution, Q minus J, okay, by dividing Q theta with a factor of J. You do moment matching, you compute Q nu, you compute this normalization factor, the update factor then is given by what you see on step D. Uh, you repeat this for all the factors, okay? Obviously, um, you know, here you're going to keep iterating uh, more than once to be sure that, uh, let's say, if these are Gaussians, that the mean of the variances of these approximations don't change with iteration. Uh, and um, uh, once you are done, you can actually uh, uh, calculate uh, the model evidence as well for free, right? So this could be something useful 
uh, for model selection uh, and, and the likes that you may be interested to do. The, the bad news is there is no proof that this will ever work. Okay? Um, and uh, um, it works often, right? But there's no proof. Okay? There is a lot of theory that uh, goes under the expectation of propagation, uh, but you know, uh, you know. So if you tomorrow come with a new PhD thesis and uh, you uh, demonstrate something about the convergence of the method, uh, everybody will be reading your paper because this is sort of still a very important uh, research topic uh, in the literature. All right. So I told you that I would uh, show you uh, the. Uh, expectation propagation result. So if I remember again, uh, uh, we are approximating uh, this uh, dark region. This is the Laplace approximation. Um, uh, uh, the minimization we got with variational Bayes. Um, uh, does it say anything about the colors? Um, Laplace. So global variation, okay, so in the EP, so this is the variation of Bayes, this, I don't know what color is, all right? And the blue is uh, the one that we get with expectation propagation. The two results are different, all right? But in this particular case, uh, if I see correctly, right, the support of the uh, EP solution is much broader than the one you get with variational Bayes, okay? So, um, depending on, the, uh, and of course this is uh, an easy distribution if you try to do this uh, for complicated problems, the answers may be completely different. Okay, uh, let me only, I'm going to give you this uh, as a fact, the proof is given on this uh, slide. Uh, so suppose, you know, you, you so you uh, have a factorization of your posterior, so you have the prior times uh, 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 each of the likelihood terms as you collect data, right? So um, let's assume that um, uh, the uh, you know you know the prior in your problem, right? You start say some Gaussian for a prior. So obviously it makes uh, uh, a sense to approximate your first factor f carry zero to be the exact prior that you started with. So what this slide does, it shows you. If you start an approximation uh, of a factor with the exact value, the algorithm will not change that uh, factor at all. I mean, that's to be expected, right? If you start with the right answer and it gives you something else, um, that sort of would be troubling. So here, if you know, uh, let's say, the prior, you can set this equal to the prior, and you don't have to worry. You can treat all the factors the same because the algorithm will not update uh, effectively this factor of zero. I mean, it will update it, but it will still give you the same answers. Okay. Now, there is uh, uh, older methods uh, that uh, uh, go uh, maybe 20 years ago uh, that they are not actually really uh, expectation propagation algorithms, but they sort of try to take advantage of these factorizations to do some similar type of uh, 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 approximations and the method that I have with a bunch of references is this assumed density uh, uh, filtering method that you may see in uh, machine learning books but they're not exactly uh, EP so EP is basically uh, the uh, the nearest approximation and uh, okay so uh, if you look at um, uh, the website of Tom Minka, which is the guy that actually uh, developed uh, expectation propagation in his PhD thesis at uh, MIT many years ago. Um, uh, his thesis was like 30 pages. Um, there have been about uh, 20 revisions of his thesis after graduation. You know what? You must have courage to revise your thesis after you graduate, right? You usually you hide under the table. No, he's not hiding because he knows people are reading it. Uh, he goes and corrects formulas, improves here and there. It's always a thesis, okay? You can obviously refer to it, and actually, if you search on the web, you will find uh, 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 very uh, high numbers of citations for his work, but the, 
only thing I wanted to tell you is for lots of uh, uh, not very difficult problems, lots of toy problems, the uh, uh, EP method shows convergence rates basically that they are superior to any of the other methods we have seen up to now, including me many methods including uh, that include uh, particle uh, or MCMC type of approximations. So you can see here the uh, error in the approximations with EP is uh, 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 the best basically for um, you know variational Bayes, uh, sampling methods, important sampling, and and, uh, and the likes. Uh, so somewhere in, uh, uh, in one of his uh, uh, papers, uh, uh, Tom Minka shows that uh, you can actually pose this problem of uh, expectation and maximization as the problem of uh, minimizing uh, uh, an energy function, right? And uh, so it's very nice, right? So there is sort of uh, an optimization version that says, you know, this is what uh, the problem is, is minimization of some function. Unfortunately, um, there is no such a thing as working with the lower bound that we saw. You remember we emphasized that the lower bound when you iterate has to increase. So here, if you do use his energy function, when you do EP iterations, there's absolutely uh, no proof, uh, no reason why that energy function will actually be maximized and will be monotonically. But somehow, uh, if the algorithm converges, then you reach the stationary of this uh, energy function. So if you get a solution, that's the right solution. Uh, what happens in between is miracles. Okay? All right. So let me um, uh, very briefly show you how the P algorithm works for this uh, um, uh, clattering problem, and then we will uh, uh, hopefully we will have a few minutes so I can tell you uh, on uh, extending this to to probabilistic graphical models, so we can make connections with other algorithms. So I remind you what the, uh, the, uh, the problem is. We really want to compute um, the, the mean uh, of this Gaussian. So we collect data, but uh, the data basically are noisy, because some of the data may be coming from this true di Gaussian distribution, but some of them can be coming from this clutter distribution, so it can be completely relevant to the mean that you want to estimate, okay? So that's why this is called the cluttering problem. We're gonna put some prior on uh, the parameters theta. Uh, obviously, uh, the unnormalized posterior looks like this. Uh, it's like if we tell me it's a Gaussian mixture, so you have two to the n terms, so this is not something uh, you can work with. Uh, so you can see here, if this is the true really Gaussian that you want to extract the mean, a lot of data concentrate here, but you have a lot of data that have nothing to do with this particular means, so you want to be able to do uh, inference on that. Um, so I am not going to show you the algebra, but I recommend that you read this problem because, you know, we mentioned things becoming uh, Gaussian-like distributions with negative variance. Uh, you can, you know, if you look at the algebra on this problem, uh, and you try to implement it, and we have a, a, a Python code, you will see why there are problems there. So I want you to actually look the algebra, at the algebra. It's not very difficult. All the proofs are in the slides. So what we're going to do is, I'm just going to summarize the results. Uh, we're going to take an approximation of Q of theta to be a multivariate Gaussian, okay? Uh, obviously, this means uh, the factors will be also uh, Gaussians. But uh, in the spirit of what we discussed about Gaussians with negative uh, variance, we're going to write each of these factors uh, some normalization term. And, uh, and, and the square exponential here, quite effectively, that variance Vn can be negative. So this Gaussian, rather than looking at Bell uh, distribution, will be turned upside down. Okay? So um, you need to start the algorithm with some uh, initialization. And um, uh, for example, you can set all of these factors to be uh, uh, equal to one. That's what is discussed here. Okay, this assumed density method does the same thing in approximating the factors when you start. So you need to have something to start with. Okay, uh, you follow the algorithm. You are going to update, let's say, one factor. You form this cavity distribution. You compute the normalization. 
you uh, do moment matching, you find Q new, and then you update the factor. So the question is, if you update the factor, uh, what will be uh, the mean and the variance of the factor? And the answers are, if I have a clean slide, maybe giving this. Uh, give me one second. Okay, so uh, so basically, the uh, here you know I thought there is a clean slide having all the answers. So if you compute first uh, uh, the cavity distribution, right, it comes to be uh, a Gaussian-like. Uh, this is the inverse variance. This is the precision how it looks like. Okay, um, uh, this is the mean. Okay. Uh, uh, the normalization factor you can compute it as well, and um, uh, and then you have to update Q new, okay? And you can show actually uh, the updates of Q new. Uh, they look and actually the updates. You know, I'm looking on factor n here, so the updates of Q new uh, look the way that you see them here. Very nice clean formula, where actually this coefficient looks like the probability of the point xn. Uh, uh, not being a clutter, okay? So, um, again, an analytical expression for this. Uh, this uh, mean of uh, the q -new distribution is known. Uh, the variance of the q -new distribution is uh, also known analytically. Two page slides of uh, derivation. All the calculations are uh, in the slides. And, uh, and then, uh, if you have Q new, uh, you have this cavity distribution as, you know, uh, Gaussians like, you can update the factor of n, and uh, the updates of the factor of n uh, are square exponentials like that as before. Uh, the mean is given by this nice expression. Uh, the precision variance is given like this. So all the calculations on the uh, clutter problem are analytical. So actually, you can see sort of the algorithm, uh, you know, in uh, with real numbers. There are no approximations, no numerical approximations. Okay, um, you can actually calculate the model evidence uh, as well analytically at the end of the day when the whole thing converges. And there is a little Python code uh, that you can run for this uh, clutter problem. And uh, this is a true result, actually, that what you see here. This is a new Gaussian for you, upside down, right? Why not? I mean, you get tired of seeing a Gaussian all the way going, uh, 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 you know, as a bell curve. Now we turn it upside down. Why not? Okay. Um, so um, again, this is uh, Fn. Uh, this is the approximation factor of n. So you notice here, it's not really that you're trying to match this with fn. Uh, you're trying to actually concentrate in the region where the support of this cavity distribution is, which is here, and that's where the approximation is good. The rest, there's nothing you can do about it, okay? And, and in some sense, you don't really care. And similarly, uh, in this case, the cavity is uh, here. Uh, so you can see the two approximations match very well, uh, almost they coincide uh, in that region. Uh, so uh, all of the error statistics actually for the clutter problem, they are in uh, uh, part of the Python code. So you can, uh, uh, if you do variational Bayes, if you use Laplace approximation, you can push it to as many data as you want to. Basically, expectation propagation for this problem performs the best, okay? In some sense, you know, Tom Minka found this cluttering problem uh, because it was uh, very easy to program, didn't need heavy computing, everything was analytical, and it was also a problem where EP comes and says I'm the best. Okay? Maybe you can do a problem that uh, EP comes and says, sorry, I'm not the best. Okay? But when you write papers, right, this is what you need to do. You need to sell uh, what you have. All right. Okay. We have uh, 15 minutes, which is uh, I don't know if it's enough time. Uh, so let's see, we're uh, slide 84. Uh, so we, uh, we're going to try to use uh, EP on graphs. And here I need your help, right? Because uh, things will get a little bit uh, messy. So up to now, 
we updated, let's say, theta, uh, and every factor was depending on the whole theta. Right? So if theta were the means and the valences and all the parameters, every factor had, you know, those whole parameters. Now, as you know, when uh, you do, for example, uh, when you work, let's say, on, uh, on the graphs, right, the factorization involves local variables. So the question is, are, can we uh, actually go and do EP-like updates in graphs where we compute uh, parameters that they are local in the graph? Because, for example, here, uh, this factor of alpha, let's say, uh, includes variables x1 and x2. So uh, can we actually go and do factorization where we update the factor of alpha? Nothing else. If we update the factor of alpha, we will only basically be updating information related to variables x1 and x2. OK, nothing else. So can somehow uh, envision that there is some local uh, expectation propagation algorithm, that's why the title of the presentation today was local variation approximations, where somehow the whole thing collapses to allow us to do an update here, an update there, an update there, etc. And even further, actually, if you um, uh, further factorize, so let's say f uh, a here is a function of x1, x2, maybe you can even factorize this to a factor of x1, so you can have a, a, a variation approximation that has one factor of only x1 and another factor of x2, and similarly here you can have something that's only a function of x2, a function of x4. Can you update each of them separately? Okay? Can you update each of them separately? And actually it's amazing you will see, that I can tell you the answer is yes you can, and then you will see everything we learn about inferencing graphs, in particular the ideas of, uh, uh, you know, message passing and, uh, uh, you know, looping delete propagation, all of these cases are subsets of the AP algorithm. So we will be able actually to discover once more these things coming locally from expectation propagation. Okay? And, uh, so, uh, and before I, 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 you know, I do this um, uh, little uh, demonstration of how this thing works, let me um, uh, give you a, a result um, that I think it was in the first lecture on, uh, on, uh, on variational methods that maybe we skipped over, I uh, didn't pay attention, all right? So let me consider the minimization, the reverse minimization of P and Q Again, this is what we do today, right? We do EP. We minimize the distance of the exact P from a variation Q. But I want to take a Q that is factorized. Right? So we're going to take a Q that is factorized over every variable. OK? Just to make things simple, but it can be factorized over groups of variables. But right now, let's take Q to be factorized as Q1 of Z1, Q2 of Z2, etc. All right, so we want to minimize this reverse KL distance of P and Q. So I'm writing this, um, the definition minus P of log of Q of P, all right? Or if you like P, log of P of uh, over Q, it doesn't matter. Okay, so, um, so let me, I'm going to start doing algebra now. Uh, remember that Q is factorized, right? It's written as a product of QIs. Uh, that are functions of zi. So because I have a log here, you agree with me that the numerator would give me minus p of z summation of the log of qi's of zi, all right? Plus minus p log of p gives me the entropy of p. I don't care. There is no dependence on q. So um, I am going to identify only the factor qj because this is what I am going to update, right? We're going to see what is the update of qj when we minimize this distance. So I am going to take qj. The rest of the terms don't depend on zj, so I don't care. All right, so I'm, I'm going to rewrite this nice thing as minus um, uh, uh, p of z, all right? And I'm going to integrate all the variables in z except j. So can you tell me this distribution, this integral, what distribution is it? So when you take p of z and you integrate everything out but j, what did, what did you get? So when you take P of Z and you integrate all the variables but J, 
the marginal. You get the marginal of, uh, Z, you know, of ZJ, the exact marginal. All right? So what you see here is the marginal. All right? So this is really the marginal, fine. Uh, okay? And um, so now we need to minimize this. It's a functional opti optimization problem. You cannot just take derivatives with respect to QJ. So you need to enforce that QJ is normalized. So you need to put some Lagrange multipliers. Then you take derivatives with respect to QJ and with respect to lambda. And then, by a miracle, it comes up that the optimal QJ is actually the exact marginal of P. OK? Uh, so if, when is this result uh, applied? When Q of Z is factorized. All right? So if, uh, uh, and again, it can be factorized over all the variables, over you know, a group of variables. You know, so the, the definition of the marginal basically is the only thing will change. But the optimal QJ of ZJ is actually P of ZJ. OK? So uh, very important result. OK? Very important result. All right, so I'm going to make use of it. So let's uh, uh, come um, so I can highlight at least this problem. And we'll continue this on, uh, on uh, Thursday. So, uh, uh, so we have a factorization a factor graph for this trivial uh, PGM here. Uh, P of x is some factor of a of x1, x2, uh, factor of b, factor of c. So obviously, it makes sense to have a variation approximation uh, for each factor. So you know, fa curly, fb curly, etc., fc curly. Uh, and, and actually, if we want to push it further, uh, we're going to factorize this further to the individual components inside these factors. So FA1 of X1, FA2 of X2, FB2 uh, of X2, FB3 of X3, etc. Okay? So that way we have a fully factorized, uh, uh, factorized variation approximation. All right. Um, so, uh, we're going to let's approximate uh, the factors that are involved in FB, okay? And we're going to do an expectation propagation algorithm, right? So we're going to uh, come up with some updates for uh, F curly B2 and F curly B3, okay? So the first thing we need to do is we need to form this cavity distribution. We basically need to remove from Q all but the things that we are interested to update. And do you remember, uh, you re uh, agree that Q minus B basically will be this? will involve all the other factors in the approximation except those two. Right? Okay. Uh, 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 then we're going to try, so we're going to, you know, we're going to try to uh, approximate, uh, we're going to try to, to bring the distance of um, uh, this distribution, you remember this? This is the exact FB multiplied with the cavity distribution. So we want to minimize the distance between this distribution and Q of X. Right, so we're going to come with some Q new update for the whole variation approximation. And then from there, we're going to come up with uh, an update for these factors by dividing by the cavity distribution. So there is uh, an optimization problem, right? We need to bring this distribution as close as possible to this distribution, right? OK, can you tell me, based on uh, what we said here, what's the answer to that optimization problem? So when we try to uh, match uh, this, the minimize this from the variation distribution, all right? Um, what is the answer for the variation approximations uh, that come out? That they have to be equal to what? So this they have to be equal to to the marginals. The marginals of what? The marginals of this. All right, so what's the marginal of uh, this, uh, uh, the marginal of x1? It's just this term, all right? What's the marginal of x2? I see there's x2 here, I see x2, there's x2. So it is this where we sum on x3. What is uh, the margin in x3? 
Uh, I see only this time here, so we have to integrate now extreme. There is anything else? Uh, what happened? Oh, you know what? I, okay, have I missed something here? So, I'm sorry, there is, okay. So, we are looking at X3, right? So, we have this, all right? It wants X2, all right? Uh, because we're going to have to integrate X2 out, the margin will involve F alpha 2 and FC2. I wasn't paying attention to that, okay? And this will marginalize in X2. Uh, X4, there is only this term, so it's like that. So the Q, what is the right answer? Is basically, remember every factor is going to be a marginal. So every factor will be this marginal times this marginal times that marginal times that marginal. So how do we update this these two factors? What do we have now to, to do to Q nu? Q is the update of the whole, the whole Q, the whole variation approximation. To get now this, we're going to have to divide this by what? Say it again? By this thing here, by the cavity, the things we keep constant in the background. So when we do this, um, all right, uh, what do we get? So basically, uh, everything here, you know, that uh, does not, de so you remember here, you have x2 and x3, right? So anything that does not depend on x2, x3 will disappear, okay? So, uh, uh, I mean, this is the only times we want, I'm sorry, everything that does not depend on those two factors will disappear. So basically what we get is, we get that the update FB2 is the summation X3 of FB, X2, X3, all right? All right, which is uh, this term, all right? And then uh, the, the FB3, okay, FB3 is, uh, FB3 is uh, this summation here. The rest, the rest, they belong to the cavity approximation, right? We will divide by this. We do not update this, right? We do not update the FA and the FC terms. Uh, we do not update the FA one term, so they will cancel out. Okay? So, effectively, what we get is, we get the update of FB2 being this, and the update of FB3 being that. Now, Let's concentrate, because we only have two minutes, on this equation. Tell me if it reminds you anything at all. So by doing this EP and effectively moment matching and all these nice, interesting things, okay, we get this equation. Does it remind you anything? Belief propagation. All right. So let's see. Uh, if you take this uh, FB of X3, let's, let me... Um, uh, uh, I need to think with you here, right? In belief propagation, the factor graphs, we only take messages that factors send to nodes. Messages nodes send to factors, basically, they are, uh, they are not needed. So if I take the product of the message that this factor uh, sends to node x2, that's this term here, and this factor sends to node x2, which is this, and then I take uh, this factor, which is a function of x2 and x3, and integrate out x2. You know what I get? I get the message that is propagated to x3. Okay? So basically, belief propagation comes uh, as a trivial exercise of uh, expectation propagation. Okay? Uh, and it's sort of, you know, uh, not necessarily expected, right? But it's just one of these miracles of, uh, of uh, uh, mathematics and ingenuity. And similarly, you can support the other term, okay? Um, I suggest that you look at the slides. Um, uh, I don't have time to uh, discuss this further. You can extend this. Uh, this is very important. Maybe this needs to be discussed on Thursday. But basically, you can uh, extend this to general belief propagation, okay? And you can show that uh, EP, if you try to update uh, this, uh, uh, so if you take, let's say, uh, the major factors that connect multiple nodes, and you factorize this as functions over the variables of each node separately, all right, you can update the same variable alone, for example. 
and the way they update this variable uh, alone, when we did message, pro uh, you know, passing, we took all the messages that are coming from this factor to the neighbors of this factor that connect to, no to this node L. And uh, so all these messages coming in, uh, you multiply with a J, and then you integrate all the variables except L, and that gives you the update of the uh, F of theta L. And it comes out that the expectation propagation gives you exactly the same answer. Okay? If you don't believe me, read the notes, but uh, we will come back on this on uh, Thursday uh, to see the miracles of expectation propagation. All right.